Good evening, everyone. Yang Yan Zhao back again tonight. Extra special guest, Rob Alderman, uh, the author of one of the best looking Kickstarter campaigns I've seen for tabletop role playing expansions, hey, which it. is currently uh, Odds of the Forbidden North Part Two. Um, somehow I had missed Gods of the Forbidden North Part 1, but 2 looks absolutely fantastic. Um, so just to start off, how did you get into gaming? Oh, uh, I guess the, um, probably a bunch of ways, but I'll start with the one, like, you know, Dad basically uh, got me. Um, so my brother and I, we, my dad was an Army officer, and he moved all over the place, you know, so like every year or two we we're moving, so we were always making new friends for losing the old friends, you know? So like, we're pretty tight knit family, you know? And so, but my dad worked a lot. And uh, so it was always felt like it was my mom and my brother and I, you know, it was always like, and then my dad would come in like the, the foundation and the, the housing of structure, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so one summer, all of a sudden out of nowhere, he's like, I got this game and we're going to play it every Saturday. And my brother and I looked at each other like, what? And it was Milton Bradley's um, hero quest. Oh, that was great. Yeah, <laughs> barbarian. <laughs> so, so my brother and I, he's like, I'm going to be Sargon. You know, my dad is real deep voice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's like man's man, you know, like special forces officer. You know? so, so like my brother and I, I was like maybe fourth or fifth grade, something like that. And uh, my my brother and I are like, well, how who's going to play what? So I was like, I'm going to be the barbarian. And he's like, well, I'm going to be the dwarf. So I'm like, well, I'm going to be the elf. And he's like, I'm the, I'm the wizard. And then I found out suddenly to my dismay that my brother gets to choose which spell cards I had. And he gives me the crappy <laughs> earth spells. So I was like, damn it. So, <laughs> so then we're stuck. So that was it. That was for the first 12 quests every Saturday, one quest a Saturday. And what happened was my brother and I just, we were just like, our dad was just he like out of nowhere, all his idea. Uh, from what I can recall, and like it just made a huge impact on us. Like this period of our time where we spent this summer with our with our dad, and like um, if you go to my brother today, like I haven't seen him in a few years. If I went and was like Mark, I was like what was a defining moment in your life? He would immediately turn to me and say Hero Quest, guaranteed. <laughs> and so like it was just this one summer. We never did it again. And um, and so what happened was, I mean, obviously, Hero Quest is probably a slight rip off of D and D a little bit, like definitely playing off it a little. Um, and like I'd never heard of D and D, and so about uh, two years later, um, we got into scouting, Boy Scouts, mm -hmm. and um, on the military bases, Boy Scouting was not dorky. <laughs> you had all these scout masters who were like rangers and like yeah, yeah. Navy yeah, SEALs. Yeah. You know, right. I never and like they're like, let's go repelling kids. <laughs> <You're> like, <"Yeah." laughs> like basically just pre-basic training, you know. So like we all the boys would do it. It was a way you made friends, you know, once you got to a certain age. And they went and did it all the way to high school. So um, my brother and I, of course, would go in we're like a little tenderfoots, you know. <laughs> So go in there. Didn't get much higher. We go in there, and um, my um, my my. There were these older kids who were, you know, the cool kids. Believe it or not, Boy Scouts. <laughs> cool kids, and and these cool kids were up there, and they were like in a tent one night. We were camping out in some army range somewhere, and you know, some of his dad was cool somewhere, and uh, we we heard like something about dragons and stuff. Of course, now we'd played Hero Quest like two years before, so we were attuned mm -hmm. to language and so i went over there my brother came with me and this one guy was like something something randolph the red and he runs up and smacks the thing with the hammer and we're listening these kids are playing ad and d second edition like you know <laughs> like that the first cover you know the not the revised one this was like uh very early 90s maybe i got my i was uh, born in 82 so mm -hmm. this, this would have been maybe 90 93 92 eh, something, okay something. 12, 11, 12, somewhere around Entering that. the dark years of D&D. &D. So this is already yeah. impressive that you found a group that easily. Yeah, no, and, and there they were. And like, um, and so they were playing and then they start, you know, watch them. We would just watch them. And uh, every time we weren't doing something fun, we were at the camps, they were playing, they were playing AD&D. &D. So I started figuring out this was, oh, this was like further along than Hero Quest. Hero Quest is a board mm -hmm. game. This is so much more, you know, and like, so... That was side of how, well, here was the thing that really got me. I think this was the true hook. They wouldn't let us play. 
because we were <laughs> so then it was like you know you want to be in there because now yeah, they're yeah, like, yeah. Cool again. and so like that mixed with the dad effect probably had a big impact and so um pretty much like within that within six months i had tracked down the books like my mom used to go buy all these harlequin romance books she was addicted to <laughs> and like she'd go to these used bookstores which is of course a gold mine for dnd right that's Absolutely. where you get your you know? so i would find the books there used and like one by one i'd pick up the core set and finally i had them all and and that's kind of how i got started so uh, what what edition of dnd did you start playing in second yeah it was, second uh, okay yeah, all right the, yeah yeah that sounds about right it had been it had been around maybe three three years by that point. That set that that uh, the, the wizard with the <laughs> TMG. Uh, uh, yeah, so. that those. Oh man, not to not to throw shade on any of the first edition stuff, but by second edition, like they really sort of fine tuned the look and the feel of the books they wanted. Uh, those were great. Those covers. What was that? Uh, it was a Jeff Easley did some of them. They were. I think so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like Jeff Easley. Yeah, I, he, he. Oh man, that guy was baller. <laughs> so. oh, I know. Too expensive. <laughs> Those guys are too expensive these days. I looked. <laughs> I looked into it. Yeah. Oh no. They deserve it. <laughs> um. So, uh, one thing I was noticing about, uh, you know, Gods of the Forbidden North. I, these days fifth edition probably has the largest player base and yeah. it's you know until wizards launches whatever the next thing that they're doing is it's still it's still sort of the the standard i guess you would say so what is it about um your module that that made the ose rules like what made that the perfect fit well, um, I, I, so I did, I started, like I said, second ed mm -hmm. and then went into third and then fourth, you know, and then fifth and, and, you know, I did the, the that track. And so I had totally missed old school, uh, D and D editions, you know, I mean, I knew about some of them, not all of them, but I, I, I didn't play any of them. Um, I had one little like session with a friend of mine named Jason, who is this uh, friend on an army base who had like a, I think maybe this maybe it was the cyclopedia or one of the basic sets. Mm -hmm. I can't remember now, but we played very briefly one or two times. But like I, I don't I don't even remember that well. But um, so like I did the like more modern you know stuff and kind of I guess if you will grew up on that. And um, I what happened was is it was really third edition sort of without realizing it sort of began to take me to the OSR and and I kind of did a circle where I circled back after a while and started getting dissatisfied and with later editions and and basically the to keep this short for you the the uh that's fine bill webb uh you know necromancer games sure you know like they were like one of the first or the first i can't remember i, I don't remember the trivia but they were like one of the first ogl third-party products out there and um for when third edition was out and around 2001 or so and um i had never seen a sandbox you know like i had all the 80 and d second like epic adventure modules you know like you know what i mean like you know like dragon mountain and all these other ones and a lot of planescape monty cook was a, a huge influence on me when i was a kid and um so like i get this you know rapanathoop dungeon of graves volume one book and i and i was like in the army i was going in the army i just enlisted and i had to store it in my suitcase and i never got to read it and um, so I was like 21, 22, something like that. I think I turned 21 or 22. I think 22 is when I was in basic training. And, um, you know, during basic, you couldn't access your suitcase. But after it was over, I went to AIT. And what happened was when I was there, I was in Fort Useless, Virginia, <laughs> becoming a watercraft engineer boat mechanic. Oh, cool. Basically what I'm saying, boat mechanic. Really, that really means looked at gauges and didn't do anything until if anything went red, the chief warrant officer would slap you and say, get out of the way. <laughs> so, I'm fixing it. You idiot. You know, So, so I, I did nothing heroic in the arm, but stare gauges. It was great. Anyway. So, so he turns around. Uh, all right. I, I get out in AIT, which now you have a little freedom and I don't really have obviously much, you know, on me, like personal, you know, personal, mm -hmm. But I did have this Panathu Dungeon of Graves book and like one or two others. And um, I opened it up and I, I might have tried to read one of the other ones first. And I got bored or whatever, distracted. And I, I got this Dungeon of Graves one. I just started flipping it open. I was like, what is this? And I just started going through it. And I, I'd heard of Mega Dungeons, but I'd never, 
I miss that train, you know? And um, I just, something about, um, God, something about like uh, Rapanathuk, and I know he pronounced it Rapanathuk. I used to say Rapanathuk for like 15 years until Phil Webb corrected me on the phone. <laughs> Very kindly. He wasn't a dick about it. <laughs> but but uh, I, I read this book and I just devoured it. And I was like, this is so awesome. Like there's not, I mean, like, you know, there's a story, but like, it's not, it's not this prescripted with acts. It's just, there's a dungeon go. And mm -hmm. I had just never played D and D that way. It's funny enough, right? Like second edition, like and on. And um, I, uh, I just fell in love with it. So as soon as I could, I went and bought volume two and three. And I think three either had just come out or was about to come out. And I'd wait for it. And I was just, so, I was just, I read the whole thing like four times, like at least. And, and I've literally ran that campaign almost 20 times since. And I, I'm running it twice right now. Nice. <laughs> that speak. Like on Fridays and Sundays. But so I guess, so I guess like, and what happened was, is I was starting to run that game and other products they did, which of course were very, this is why I was mentioning it, very old school in their design. Like he's got, mm -hmm. like he doesn't have encounter balance. He doesn't have that stuff, you know, it's just awesome, you know? And, uh, and I, I guess like I was, really looking at encounter design a lot in third edition, fourth edition. And then I was seeing this and it was like this contrast. It took a few years to sort of sink in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally got to the point where I was like, you know, all this stuff and this rules. And I mean, they're cool. And I, you know, I like modern games, nothing against them, but like, I kind of like the magic of this. And I, I didn't realize it, but this was really an OSR product. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, like, and back in 01, 02, or 03, you know, there was, they hadn't called it that yet. You know, it was a few years, like maybe well, four or five. So like eventually swords and wizardry sort of in Osric started to kind of make waves labyrinth Lord, I think. And um, I think it was Osric and swords and wizardry that caught my attention and uh, swords and wizardry in particular. And I read Matt Finch's um, primer on old school. And then I, it's oh. like, I, it's like you're reading an OSR product, but you're used to like newer stuff and you mm -hmm. like, maybe there's something special, but you can't put words to it. And then yeah, you read yeah, yeah. his primer, whatever you think of that document. Like, and it just, it was like light bulbs went off for me, you know, like it was like, wait a minute. This is so, this is totally different. This, this explains why this is so, you know, like, or begins to, you know, like it's like a, it was like opening a window or something that I didn't mm -hmm. know about. And anyway, it was just, I guess that, I mean, I know I went kind of off script here, but that kind of um, that kind of led me eventually to appreciate more and more about the OSR. And so by the time I got to fourth edition, what happened was is all my mm. buddies rebelled against fourth head. Uh, I enjoyed yeah. the game. I was just like, it's just a different game. You know, I, I was like, you know, it's yeah. a game, whatever, come on. But like, you know, they they did not like it. So they were like, we'll put a finder. I was like, oh, back to third edition. I started scatting. <laughs> The last game I ran for it was this 11th level starting to 20th. I was trying to do like epic mythic. And I just remember like one day I was like, how I just spent three hours statting one monster. They're going to kill in about 30 minutes. Yeah. What's there's something wrong here. <laughs> Rapana Thug and Matt Finch of the OSR is calling to me. So it turned into like swords and wizardry. And then I start going mm -hmm. through all the great retro clones, basic fan, you know, and I guess like by the time I got to writing, you know, this book, you know, it was, um, that had become the thing I really enjoyed um, the most. I still play other games. I've got a 5e game right now, but you know, there's just, it's something different, something special about the. Uh... Yeah. You know, I, well, one thing is, I think we're far enough away from the, you know, the, the game that Gary created back in the seventies and yeah. that early generations where uh, we sort of separate the wheat from the chaff, you know, yeah. and, and it's like when, when you look, when you look at books like, you know, we think of like Conan the Barbarian and HP Lovecraft and we consider them classics now, yeah. but how much other crap was there at the time, you know? <laughs> so like, I think in the role-playing game wise, we're at that point where we can really figure out what stood out and we can sort of start to piece together like, well, why was this so good? What made that so good that it stands the test of time? With, That's uh, my thought. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I guess, um, you mean with like, um, uh, like first edition, like the original, like, yeah, like the sort of the old school play style, like yeah. why did people, you know, I, I've, I've often wondered like, is it a fashion thing? 
You know, is it like, yeah. um, you, you know, you, you become an old fart and then you still listen to a lot of the same music you did in high school <laughs> and you kind of wonder to yourself, like, well, it was the music really better or am I just old? Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I sort of think role playing games are like that, too. But I think we can really sort of say, like, well, no, there actually were a lot of things that they were doing right. And, you know, like for. For me, fifth edition, uh, I'm working on a campaign guide for fifth edition, but I want it to feel like old school. Yeah. And, you know, they, they are very different games with different yeah. mechanics, but um, there's there's definitely been a different feel to 5e. Sure. So, some of the earlier campaign modules that they came out with it, uh, you know, Curse of Strahd and Tomb of Annihilation and yeah. stuff like that, they, they tried a little bit, but, um, you know, a lot of the newer ones, they just totally different game. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I get like, well, let me ask you, can I ask you a question? What, uh, yeah, what's yeah. Your, I guess what's your favorite, like your go-to, like, I mean, I, like I get caught up, like, obviously it's just the player I play online. So five mm -hmm. is so much easier to find people. Yeah, I exactly. Be, yeah. I wind up playing five more than anything. And I always like, I'm no, I'm going to do all this. But anytime I put an ad out, like it's so it's tough. Hard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think part of that is they, they don't know the rules. Um, they've heard the horrors of Thaco or Thaco, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and then I think that part of it is they're, they're just not exposed to that way. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, you know, not to toot my own horn too much, but in the campaign guide I'm working on, yeah. um, you very quickly, uh, the party will end up getting cursed by a god and having all their death saves removed. Um, so, you know, you you better believe they start thinking about the game differently That's right fun. away. <laughs> so if you if you change a little bit of the mechanics and you make it a little bit more like old school, but then for me, like 5e plays a little bit more like superheroes where you're leveling up so fast and getting abilities. Like for me, that's fine. It's It's different than than how it used to be. But... Um, if you keep it to where the danger's there and you have more similarities in terms of, um, you know, you're there for loot, you're there to accomplish something for your God or, or this or that. And it's more like dungeon crawly or, um, hex crawl or whatever. Uh, they start to respond a lot more to it than, uh, than a lot of the players would, I think. But. It's like the um no you're no you're right I um it, you know it's like when you remember those comic books like when the the bad guys like or the good guys like puh, 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 and yeah then, like, yeah yeah and it pisses him off and he just gets up and he's like eighties mo movies heroes mm -hmm. they're suddenly immune to everything <laughs> you know like like that's kind of like five evil uh, characters yeah. you know like yeah, yeah 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 they go down they go down they get down you're like healing word they stand up. <laughs> and you're like no and then they die <laughs> the bad guy dies but yeah no it's totally like that i um i think it's still fun i just think um my it's my different environment yeah <laughs> what'd you say yeah. it's different it's a different yeah. game i thought you said it's crap oh no no i enjoy 5e <laughs> It just I heard the tail end of the word sounded that way. <laughs> no, <laughs> I heard a lot. I have a lot of friends who say that. <laughs> no, but I, yeah. I enjoy it. I love Five E. I'm a. I like all. I actually like all the editions. Um, from some perspective, like I think they're all mm -hmm. something to learn from each one of them. I um, and it's not me being a wimp and not picking one. I uh, I liked them all. Like I just I played a lot of them, and I think there's a charm to every single one of them. A difference, you know, but. There's something different about each one too. I, um, I, one of the things I did to make Five E to kind of go back to what you were saying, because uh, I agree with you, like um, it does seem more fun when the when they're scared of death. Yeah. Um, and I for Five E, like I, I got my own little house full document. I'll send it to you after this if you want to look at. It. But I, yeah. I, I, you know, I've been tinkering. I always tinker and like I like playing with rules. And so I, I try to come up with ways to like scare the players. And I, sometimes you, I feel like you can scare players without actually truly threatening them. But like. Mm -hmm. that does the trick um it makes them think they're gonna die and then they get scared and you can see it you know you're like yes yeah, relish it <laughs> but, but um yeah no i um i, I agree with you i think uh, the, the the death thing i i i always roll like openly on the table and, and, mm -hmm. I, and if i don't when i roll 20 when i use roll 20 i always 
timestamp everything. And I tell him, look, if you think I'm full of it, you can call me on it. And um, I will go and take a, take a screenshot of like what was rolled with the timestamp and all the things right around it. So, you know, I'm not like zooming in and trying to roll it three times and zoomed in, you know, <laughs> something cheesy. Uh, I like rolling on the table and honestly, like you get a lot of flack, I think as a, as a referee, as a DM. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? When you're rolling behind the screen and like, you don't tell them. Yeah. I think, I think there's something inherently different too, about using roll 20 rather than in person behind a screen. Like, I don't know. I don't know why that is. Um, you know, I'm, I've been running some test groups for a while and um, everything's online now since COVID has been online. And there's definitely like if, if in roll 20, I hit the like send to DM um, as opposed to like do it publicly. Like you, you start getting a little like moans and groans like, Oh, he evaded your, your fireball. No, we did. What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, where, whereas I didn't hear that as much, you know, if they could see me like rolling the dice and they hear yeah. it roll and I say, Oh, it didn't work. You know, if his somehow that, that was better. Yeah. His hand, let it go. I, it, whatever it was, he didn't touch it. <laughs> it's still there. It's still there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Merdig asks, um, what do you and Rob think of new 60 rules that is going to be released? You want, you want to go I, ahead? Oh, uh, I haven't really read many yet. There's a few things that I think makes the game worse that pushes it more in the death saving throw direction, which is um, I don't like the, like I like in combat, if you get a 20, that always hits. If you get a one, it always fails. Um, but I don't like that in anything else. So like it, it makes no sense to me that if you have a door that has a lock by the world's greatest artificer and guarded by magic and you're level one and you happen to roll a 20, it pops open. That makes no sense to me at all. <laughs> is that, is that what they're doing? I, I I'll be honest. I haven't That's read almost anything about the new edition yet. I always wait. I, yeah, like, I'm an MFA writer, so like mm -hmm. I'm like I look. I used to tell my students nothing counts till the final draft, you know. Like <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. I, I don't want to see it till it's done and whatever they're gonna call it. And then I know what it is. Then I want to read it, and then I'll make a decision on what I like about it, or you know. But I really haven't read too much. Uh, I hate to hate to. Sorry, I, I don't have a good yeah, answer. I don't. I don't have a whole lot of opinions on it. I haven't. I heard they're gonna update the monk class a bit, but. I don't know. It's supposed to be backwards compatible, which is nice, but I, I think they're going to have a real hard time selling 6E. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of like 4E type. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah I don't want to exactly. like, you know, everyone says that already. So it's not even like, <laughs> you know, it's just sort of cliche now, but yeah, I don't know. I just, but then also, I noticed that people also will blah, blah, blah until it comes out that everyone rushes and buys it. So. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> They're like, oh, look, a 1% dip. Oh, well. <laughs> you know? And I'll buy it. Watch, I'm going to go buy it. I'm going to go see what the, you yeah. got it, right? You got to go see what they're doing. You know, at least Of course. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just think it's going to be tough overall because you have such a large user base using 5e now. And they spent so much money on uh, books and and various accoutrement. You know, are they going to say like, oh, now this thing that I've spent hundreds of dollars on is useless. Let me go buy all the new stuff. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work. Well, it's been, what, 10 years? So, I mean, like... Um, yeah, 10 years. I, 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 you know, I saw, like, literally, like, maybe, like, four days ago, I pulled up this... <laughs> my wife's like, um, can you explain to me the... Uh, like the different, like what's BX? <laughs> so like yeah. there was someone made this, you can find online. I don't remember whoever did this. You're a genius, wherever you are. But they made like this, like, like poster map of like the mm -hmm. evolution. Have you ever seen that little poster? No, no, I haven't. It's really cool. Anyway, like uh, it's got like all the editions, like the history of the editions. Like I think that's what I use to find it, history of editions, images, and just look and I found it. And um, it's really cool. And it breaks down like all the different times. So I pulled this like out and I'm going through it. One of the things I did was I started Actually, at one point, we for some reason we both started counting how many years were between each um, edition, and uh, 
I think 10, like 10 years, actually, I think if I remember right, was actually a, a lot. Like it was actually, um, mm -hmm. it's actually been quite a bit. So if they're going, if they are going five, five, like a, a revised kind of thing, then I mean, like that's going to be a long addition. Like even if it's just three yeah. years, that's like, that's a long time. So I don't know. I, it's interesting. It's, it's going to be tough. Um, but as we're here, uh, gods of the forbidden North, uh, why don't, why don't you give us the quick overview? Oh, I'm about to break 80. Woohoo! <laughs> maybe you did. I haven't refreshed this in a while. Let's see. Oh, so yeah, close. Yeah, that's so close. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. I'm excited. So, uh, Come sorry, on, well, guys. I see 28 people watching this uh, <laughs> right now between YouTube and uh, Twitter. So go on over there. Just tip it over. All we need is 45 more dollars. <laughs> Or thirty-five more dollars. So it's like nineteen dollar pledge, one dollar <laughs> pledge. You're like, oh come on. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, so, so give us the the thirty thousand foot overview. Thirty thousand foot overview. There's three massive books that are going to combine to make a thirteen to fifteen hundred page massive setting, wilderness hex crawl slash underworld point crawl slash mega dungeon. <laughs> there are like twelve dungeons total. There's an urban quest. There are a few other like urban quests that build off the first one, but are kind of woven in later on at a higher level. Like one's first level, one's fifth level. Like uh, I'm, 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 revi I'm actually proofreading that chapter right now. Uh, Children of the Green Light, which is sort of a an ode to Lee Brackett. Uh, and she did a, a short story called Child of the Green Light. So like there's a little bit of like you know messing with things there, but uh, maybe a little Great Gatsby. But anyway, <laughs> so like uh you know like so there's a lot. There's just like it's just imagine this massive map, wilderness with massive underworld map under it, and they connected like 29 different places, and there's 12 dungeons spread out all over, and all these literally two to three hundred like d detailed like you know uh, encounter areas in the wilderness and underworld. Um, and they kind of all connect in different fun ways. And then you've got like a city on the above and city below and towns above and, and little towns below. And, and like, they all have like, you know, quests. Like, I, I mean, I think of it almost like a gigantic, you know, like, like Skyrim or something, you know, like mm -hmm. so much to do. And there, there's sort of a, there's an adventure path that I kind of laid out where it's like, you know, if you play that way, if you just want to, you know, like you don't meet very often and you don't really have time to do like the, the committed thing. I, I wanted to make it where players could just, okay, we're just going to say a line of pros and jump you to the next thing and just dive into the next chapter. And here's what's happened. But then there's also for those of us like myself who like science, you know, sandboxes, uh, basically like you can just, you know, the urban quest is there. It's optional. You know, you can blow it off mm -hmm. if you want to, but it gives you like a, Hey, you don't, you're, you're new to the place. You're not meeting in a tavern. You know, you, you already have a quest, you know, like, something mm -hmm. that you're already together on a quest and like, you don't have to like do the awkward, like, Hey, what are you, <laughs> you know, when everyone just met each other yeah, and everyone's yeah, already yeah. awkward, you know, like, no, we're just, you just throw him into combat in a situation, let things go, you know, and that seems to speed up. And so, I mean, that's really the whole thing. And um, yeah, it's a, it's big. It's uh, I, the, yeah, I, th I think it's going to be around 13 to 1500. Cause right now the wow. second one's about 352 pages. You know, the first one got expanded to 480 with the errata and the map change I just did. And we kind of did the, redid the layout with Glenn. Uh, so it's already, it's like 832 pages right now. So I, but the last one's going to be the biggest book cause that covers the mega dungeon, the Cyclopean city and the Tesseract of time. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in there. It's the mega dungeon this is what's kind of cool. Mega dungeon is basically ninth level higher. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's it, the whole mega dungeon is just high level <laughs> so, wow. so it's, it's been challenging to write but like i'm a child of the 80s man <laughs> so i've got all kinds of crazy stuff in the back of my head i'm like zelda and link you know, the, the hand and zelda yeah like, take you to the beginning of the dungeon all that stuff's coming back baby nice <laughs> coming back, so. so how long has it taken you how long have you been writing this long time um, I, I, I honestly, I'm not even hundred percent certain anymore. I, it was probably <laughs> like, I, I think there were phases, like there was a, there was a good, um, four or five years that I was writing this sort of just for fun in between serious writing. Um, mm -hmm. and it really wasn't meant to be anything. It was just, uh, me just screwing around. Like I got so inspired by like Rapanathuk and, and other cool dungeons I'd seen that like, um, 
I was like, you know, I'm going to do my own one day. You know, I just got to take a stab at it, right? <laughs> just gotta, mm -hmm. And it was just something I doodled in between, like when I'm in my office hours at Penn State and waiting for the next student to show up, you know, because they're hungover or whatever. I'm sitting, there, <laughs> I'm sitting there doodling, drawing a map or like, you know, come up with some ideas and just like, you know, and, and what happened was it was all in a folder and, um, you know, or, or on a Word doc. And then what happened was is I would forget about it. And then um, a couple months later, I, you know, tumble upon it again and, oh, hey, that reads pretty cool. And I'd go back and start continuing. And I'd see all my mistakes as a writer and want to fix them. And, and I'd get back into it. And then I'd, you know, again, fall out. And it just on and off, on and on and on. And um, one day I actually finished, um, like I had like all these chapters and half-ass written states and uh, parts of the thing. And, and I'd finished one. It was actually the... Um, the two first chapters I ever finished actually were the um, the very last chapter, which a couple of my backers have seen in its, in its rough draft, uh, the Tesseract of Time, the final final countdown. <laughs> you know? But the, uh, the and then the and then the other one was the Fort Eichenbar chapter with the slavers of Shun. So mm -hmm. I was like, you always got to have a fortress with some slavers. <laughs> you got to go of kill course. them. Yeah. Right? You got to. So am <laughs> I getting flack from that? I guess, apparently nowadays, but. So I turn around and I'm like, they're bad guys. So the slavers, I finished that chapter um, and it was, you know, there's a rough draft a while ago, but like I finished it and um, I put it away. And I, at this point in my life, I'd gotten really frustrated with my literary writing. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm a failed writer who's become an RPG guy. I eat it. Yes. That's the best way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I published stuff. Like I published poetry. I published po short fiction. I had a novel. I, I accidentally threw away the entire manuscript. <laughs> so like all kinds of disasters. Oh, no. Yeah, that was that was a dark day. But so I, I turned around and um I just got really tired of writing literary writing. Um I I had some pieces that I thought really proud of. And I got to the point where I just I wasn't enjoying it. I felt like I was doing it for work, like for career, like to please this group of people. Because it was yeah. basically all these it was other creative writers. Like you're not writing for the masses like you think of when you think writer. In the academic world, you're writing for the, um, you know, forgive me if you know this already, but I guess for the audience, you know, like I, you're writing for like really your other creative writing fellows who mm -hmm. are doing these lit mags that nobody reads except them, right? And like, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You're exactly. trying to, you're right. You're trying to rack up all these publications, and you get enough of these on enough pages, and you have the right quality, and maybe you land at some tenure job. And I was a teaching faculty trying to get the tenure, trying to get the publication. Uh, so it's cool. rough these days. Yeah. No. All right. I was. So I was teaching five, six class. I was actually teaching all the kids. No, they weren't. <laughs> I was teaching I had thousands of students, probably. Um. But uh. Anyway. So like, I I got to the point where um, I just felt like I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do, and I wasn't enjoying it, and I kind of got burned out. And um, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. Like you think of it this way: you work, 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 work. You spend. I, I drafted one short story that was like five pages, like. 42 times over like three or four years. I mean, it was ridiculous. I still never got that thing published. <laughs> like, okay. so, and then when you do, you don't get paid. You just put a line on your CV. So you get to the, <laughs> you get, you know, it's yeah. demoralizing, right? So you, you turn around. So I, after a while, I was like, you know, like, I, I like, I love writing. I like writing literature. I do. I was just got a little burned out. So I was like, and then right as that happened, I come across the Slavers of Shoon. Fort Eichenbar, and I started reading it, and I couldn't put it down. Like I, it had been a while since I'd read it, and I just forgot about it. And like, if you know, have you ever had that experience where, like, oh yeah, you read your own stuff, but you haven't read it a long time, and it's like it's not you. And I remember I had this like sort of moment where I went, "Hey, this is really good." Like, you know, yeah, you gotta, you know, you edit this that, but like, this is reading just as good as the, the really good stuff out there. Like, hey, why don't you? You you got all this dungeon like why not just why not just do it and uh, so at first it was sort of like yeah I'll just work on it and just take a break and that was the idea and then what happened was is I never got tired of it I love writing <laughs> like it's so much fun <laughs> like you know it's my hobby that's awesome it's still like a hobby even when you're working on it like I so for me I just um I, I mean I spent like four hours today working on it and uh I, I every moment of it i loved it like even when it was complicated when i was like running into walls it was like a puzzle you want to play like when you're playing video games you know like you're enjoying it mm -hmm. and I, I, wow. I didn't feel that anymore with the literary writing and i, I really hated it <laughs> i really hate it like 
So you have to like match, you have to guess their aesthetic and try to match their, what they're looking for. And so anyway, it just, um, I guess, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I'm kind of curious. So you mentioned, uh, you know, poetry and various stories. Yeah. Have you sort of sneaked any of them into this? Like for example, uh, Oh, if you're in an inn, you'll hear a bard singing, uh, this poem. And then, then you just like chuck it in. Oh, totally. Like I, <laughs> I'd sleep a little bit in there. Yeah. Like I got songs and such and nice, really, ba really bad poems, like, <laughs> like intentionally, like kind of making them funny, you know, or like the things don't quite line up, but they make sense in the song. Like definitely like messing around. Um, the, the, actually the back, um, this actually is, um, it looks like prose, but there's actually on the, uh, the back matter of the book, mm -hmm. The little uh this is the setup of the whole thing like that um that that's actually sort of uh a little poetry a little bit um i i it's almost like uh what's the word i'm looking for it's been a little while since creative right <laughs> so it's it's sort of like uh, prose poetry where it's sort of disguised not not quite i mean i'm not like trying to like you know get published with that like <laughs> like on its own but mm -hmm. i was uh i was actually funny enough like if you watch uh, uh he-man masters of the universe the movie like Dolph Lundgren and the greatest oh movie <laughs> yes that movie like may have let's, done more for me than any, anything my parents. let's let's pray that's one movie Hollywood never remakes <laughs> I totally understand the criticism it's still the best movie ever <laughs> love that movie well you know when your parents used to like film like like they used to record whatever was mm -hmm. on with the vhs yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like, my parents had masters of the universe and a couple star wars movies nice and indiana jones temple of doom which you'll see a big mm -hmm. one you see a lot of temple of T indiana jones is going to be in volume two a lot more than you you saw in volume one <laughs> but um, <laughs> <all the rum. laughs> but, um yeah no i i watched masters of the universe probably eight billion times with my my brother and we would perform it and act it out so like when I when I was and I bring it up because when I was writing that back little lines, if you ever go back and watch like the um, the opening scene, type of Masters of the Universe, nineteen eighty seven or whatever year it was, uh, opening scene, and it's like at the center of the universe, at the border between the light and the dark. And if you listen to like the voice of the guy as he says the um, as he says the lines, and kind of like if you blur out so to speak in your head what he's saying. A lot of the first couple lines, but not the end, uh, sound the same. Mm -hmm. I was doing that intentionally because I'm sort of echoing that awesome movie that plays over my head probably a million times. <laughs> and because I mean, like, come on, like Skeletor in that movie was the greatest villain of all time. <laughs> Sorry, that... James Bill Jones. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that movie. Like, it's some of the things that happened were a shame, like the budget, but. Um, <laughs> You know, the people who were in it, uh, at least Skeletor and then uh, Dolph Lundgren, I thought, you know, those guys were trying to make that work. Yeah, I always like the cop, Lubick. Yeah. It's so great. I was like, this is so not the cartoon. Who cares? He's got a shotgun, pump shotgun. It's so great. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen some great uh, videos online about, you know, just what happened or what went wrong with the making of that movie. Uh, but it was fantastic. You you can't ask for more entertainment. I think it's and, really cool that. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sam. No, no, no. 90 minutes of Masters of the Universe is <laughs> is all you need to make your weekend. It's so good. I love um, I my favorite story about it is the uh, that um, what's his name? Um, uh, gosh, I know his name. Uh, uh, who's the uh, Skeletor? Um, I'm just uh, his face uh, there. He was in Ninth Gate. He was in all kinds of yeah. Movies. Always like his name. Oh, uh, just totally blown. One of the one of the guys will say it anyway. So he, I I watched this thing where he was talking about an interview where he said I think that's his favorite role he ever did because he got to be like the best dad in the world because his son was like really into He Man. Mm -hmm. So he's like, he got cast for it, and he's like, he just goes all out like I'm gonna be the greatest Skeletor of all time. <laughs> like he achieves it. There you <laughs> go. Yeah, yeah. Yes, That's it. Yeah. I couldn't think of his name for a second. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah. No, it was. I mean, he's so he monologues so well. Like he's the only guy who can monologue. Even He Man has to stop and listen. 
<laughs> it's so good. Anyway. Oh, I haven't thought about that movie in a long time. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> well, let me tell um, you, Valor mm -hmm. the Skull God. <laughs> There's a little bit of an influence there. So, 100%. Uh, so when you're writing, uh, what yeah. makes a good uh, hex crawl? So that's something I, I found that in a lot of modern games, not even just Dungeons and Dragons, like people just want to skip, like we're in this town, we'll skip to the next town. Or if we're going to some abandoned mine now, we'll just skip to the mine. What what makes a good hex crawl? Oh, let's see. Um, Like in the sense of like, um, like in the encounter and design themselves or more like, uh, or just in general or like, um, or like um, the rules, like I, I guess. Um, I would define good uh in most tabletop power playing games as something players enjoy okay because like, right. at the end at the end of the day the game's got to be fun right you right. could have the most creative setup but if people are like sure. this is boring then it's no good sure okay all right no that, that makes sense all right so um i i guess the the i guess the first thing is is um sort of and i guess i'll hearken to point crawl stuff like mm -hmm. uh, like that kind of fit for those of you that have heard like point crawls like um you know, like kind of like the idea of like like a dot and then a line and then another dot. And like you kind of create this map, not with the, with the hexes, but with these little lines. And what the idea is that you make each choice meaningful, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I, I think so. I think the hex crawl, if it's just like we're just going to randomly go in a random direction, whatever. I think that can be kind of boring. So the trick is, I think. And I'm not saying I hit this out of the park. <laughs> I'm just saying this is what I was trying to do, <laughs> but like making it where like choice matters. So like, yeah, um, you know, if we go left, we see roughly in the direction that this is what we're facing. We go right, we got that kind of obstacles facing us, and maybe we've learned a little bit of this and that to know more about what's in each direction. So now there's like a meaningful choice, right? You can choose which way to go, just like a dungeon, right? Like you hear mm -hmm. like the sound of some weird squishy water down the left hall you hear strange silence and weird cracking noises down the right one you have a little context you can kind of make some sort of meaningful choice or test things out i guess like in the same way like just looking at it as like a dungeon crawl but like you know with just a different look of walls and such like you know you got mountains and hills i you know like well you know we could go through the mountains but that would be problematic because of xyz you know like maybe there's tougher monsters there the weather's really, really extreme, or you can get lost or die or whatever. And then, um, but if you go down the plains way, the bad guys will definitely see you because that's what they're expecting. <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah. So you got like a choice there, right? So like, you know, take the pass of Courageous or whatever the hell that place is called. Gandalf and them go there, and the snow gets all over them. They're like, that sucked. Let's go back. <laughs> you know? So I guess that kind of an idea, like. Uh, streets and roads that are kind of clearly kind of marked in a sense but without being so obvious mm -hmm. um i hmm. think that's the first thing i think the second thing is um just not having just one i mean you know some people swear by this nothing against them but in my opinion like having um not more than just wandering monsters like mm -hmm. um so like one of the things i try to do is first i do have wandering monster tables but i have it where there's activity tables and Joel mm -hmm. Hines, actually, who's got a, a Kickstarter called the Shrike Up right now. It's doing really well um, on Kickstarter right now. But he actually uh, helped me design that activity table. He did a really good job. And um, so, like, you know, rolling a die and, like, seeing that maybe these monsters are, like, they're waiting for some other monsters, you know, in the area. And so they maybe don't, they don't want to mess with you, so they're willing to talk. Or, you know, as long as you keep your distance. So, like, that makes it where not everything's just a slog. Um, yeah. And then, of course, yeah. having encounter areas that are widely, you know, like, like, like some are exploring, some are discoveries, some are social, some are, or a mix, you know, like mm -hmm. trying to keep it where everything's kind of alive and different for those scripted encounters. I think, um, and that's, that's what I tried to do. I tried to do that as much mm -hmm. as I could. Um, and in fact, I redid the maps, the ones that you're looking at right now, like the, um, the original map, um, was, was really good. I liked, and it's actually appears in the front of the book. I'll show it to you. Um, Billy did it, and then I think he did a great job. I love the book, and it was really, and it was still, you can still see that it's very similar. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I found was when I was actually looking at it and trying to turn it into a uh, hex crawl, that it was, I felt like it was, I needed to redo a few things and change a few terrain elements that could still be there on this picture, on the then on the other one, you know what I mean? Like, if we mm -hmm. 
or imagination. Yeah. So I did a few things when I revised it to make it um, more like I was saying, like meaningful choices. Like you could cut through this way, but you could cut through that way. So I tried to do that with the map. And then, um, and then of course, my map sucked. So I had Glenn Seal redo it because <laughs> he's way better at that than I am. I'm just a writer. So, <laughs> but, um, but now it looks amazing, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it looks fantastic. Yeah, he did a great job. He did. It's got a black and white one now in the in the second printing of the book and that's the color one that um you can get with it and stuff uh that comes with it now as part of the uh the free downloads but um nice stuff um so you know one other thing that i was noticing is uh you've got a lot of great art in this book um how how did you decide on you know how much art and what art you're gonna have uh, well, first, it was, just, it was just like, I want cool art. Uh, and I was funding the project out of my own pocket. So I just liked art. I got it. And then <laughs> and I was like, I like Ian Bagley. His art's awesome. So I'm going to go get Ian Bagley. <laughs> That's pretty much there you go. That's about oh, as okay. as that. And then, uh, but then, it, that, and of course, once it got more serious, and it was really going somewhere. And I had to go get a Kickstarter and I had to answer to people. <laughs> Suddenly I had to come up with a plan, right? Yep. So then I um I said, well, you know, I want to have a, a really wide array of artists. Um, I didn't want to just, you know, some books you see just have one. And I think mm -hmm. that's cool. I I wanted a bunch of different artists to show that, like, even with the same like character, for example, with people taking different takes on him or her or whatever, it and I, I just wanted to like kind of use a bunch of them that all had the same general aesthetic and or, 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 or something that complemented each other, I felt did, at least as a dumb layman who's not an artist. Um, and I think I achieved that. <laughs> I haven't heard anyone yeah. complain. Um, I felt the art seemed like it went together, and um, even when it was a different style. Um, and I was, one of the other things I told myself was no art piece that is blah, at least to me. Yeah. Maybe other people will not like it because it's art, but I wanted to wear every piece of art I'm happy I put it in the book. And I feel that way. I feel that way. I, um, cause you know, like you'll see like a, like some books where there's like, Oh, that's amazing. Oh, it's amazing. You're like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I mean, that's taste, you know? And, but so I was like, what's well, my book. I'm going to make it to my taste. So <laughs> that's what I did. But, uh, I met a lot of cool, really cool artists. And, um, I love like Carlos Castillo and P uh, Peter Pagano's, um, work and of course you got terry right there he did he's a hollywood concept artist he did a lot of work mm -hmm. with movies and, and hollywood and such now he lives in texas and um he did a lot of the the, the tarngrack uh big monsters the kaiju type monsters and um and of course billy did all the maps um until uh glenn came and did the recent uh wilderness ones again but um i was just very pleased with everyone's work i remember just i it was cool like uh when i was doing the art I would um, I would turn around and say, like, here's kind of what I want to go for. But I wouldn't like I want his right arm up. You know, I wouldn't like mm -hmm. I would just sort of say, here's roughly what I'm going for, like a vision. And I would just sort of and they like some of them were like, OK, I'll take it. And run with it. And others were like a little more like, oh, surely you want me to do this? Or I was like, just how do you feel inspired by that? Go for it. And like, I'm telling you, every single time they came back and I was always like, wow, that's so much cooler. <laughs> So, yeah, I love the art in this book. It's it, you know, speaking of OSR, uh, you know, there, there was definitely a feel, um, especially after you got out of that very first generation of uh, D&D books. But yeah. there's a great pen and ink kind of classic feel that, you know, is represented here, even though you, you do have different styles, uh, which I kind of prefer because, you know, if, if I'm running this campaign, it's going to be different from if you're running this campaign. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, by having like slightly different styles, you know, it, it, um, what's the word I'm looking for these days? More inclusive, I guess you say it makes it seem more expansive. You know, it's yeah. not like, Oh, it has to be this way. It's like, no, no, you make it cool. Make it your own stuff. I had, a, I, it was funny. I had a guy, um, uh, one of the artists did Balor, the skull god, and, and I mm -hmm. gave very few, like, I said, here's a couple characters that are inspired by the, that, that inspired this character. 
I don't really want to tell you what he looks like. I want you to just, here's what I've written about him. Here's his history. And you tell me what you see, you know, like, and that's what I did. And so the one guy was trying to, their two artists were working on him at the same time. And uh, one of them was like, well, I'm going to wait till the other one's done and just see what he did. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> do your own. And so he starts like kind of doing it, but I think he slowed down intentionally. To see what he's gonna do. I'm like, no, no, no I, wanted to be, I wanted to be told, you know. And so like what happened was he kind of compromised. He saw a draft of what he was doing, mm -hmm. a sketch, just a sketch. And then, uh, and then of course now the pictures you, the few pictures you have of Balor, you know, one you got Johns and you got Ian's, and they're similar, but they're also kind of their own, their own takes. So I, I thought that was cool. I really wanted them to just do something totally different. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's all right though. I oh no, it's yeah no, I I was I don't know, I I like the I mean I remember I'm a I'm a writer so like I like a poet and. To me, it's like when, you know, I want every person that reads the poem to look at it differently and see something totally different. Yeah. So for me, the art is just, you know, a reflection of that. So for me, I don't, uh, there doesn't have to be a right way that, you know, that, you know, Bal or whoever looks like um, it, it can be whatever you really want it to be at the end. Um, but, you know, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, I also appreciate when they do have a consistency. I get what you're saying. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask you a question that I sure. myself screwed up a couple years ago when I was on somebody else's channel. Oh. Um, how, uh, how would you say writing, um, like if you're writing a novel or short stories, how does that differ from writing for, uh, like an adventure guide? Well, that's a big question. Um, I, I think, um, well, the first thing, of course, is, you know, in a novel, I control everything. Um, I control everything in this book in a sense, but I also have to like basically create like kind of like a video game. Like I control the, uh, you know, the, 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 what's the word, the, um, the physics, if I'm mm -hmm. the designer, right. I create like, obviously the boundaries of the world, like the mountains. Okay. You can't go past that in Skyrim, you know, it's too steep, yep. <laughs> but like, it looks like it's, you could, you know, even though it's not true. Um, and like, you know, so like you design the world, you design the, what's in it, you design the stuff, but you also have to say like, okay, like, and even if you have a story or some kind of like plot or whatever, that's like a dot, 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 A to B to C kind of a thing, you, you lay it there. Like, and I like, I like thinking of Skyrim, a, a big game like that, an open world kind of game where there is a story you can choose to follow if you want but you know you can just turn around and run off into the wilderness at any point, do whatever else you want as well. And I, I like that. So I that's sort of what I guess that's what I had in the back of my head when I wrote it. And I think that's the difference with the novel. You know, like the novel mm -hmm. is totally scripted, right? It's it's there's no you can your 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 freedom is in interpreting it, right? And what you think it might be saying. Like you, you watch two, you know, No Country for Old Men, like the movie or read the book. And, you know, you can have a really good conversation about Wimby, what, what you got out of that book or what that, or that movie, both, both I think are literature, but, uh, and this one, um, you can still have themes. You can still have, um, you know, like, uh, art wrapped in there and, and hidden and packaged into it. But I feel like, um, you know, at the end of the day, you have to remember that it's a game. Mm -hmm. So like a video game. And this is why I thought this is why I had this in the forefront of my mind, like Skyrim or other games like it. The end of the day, it's about the person having fun who's playing it, yeah, and playing it the way they want to play it, right? Yep. So, um, you know, you can't you can't pre-script out the this is how you solve this. You have to say well, what are, are there. Every time I come to a challenge, I was like, I want to make sure there's a bunch of ways to solve something. Um, that doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, but I'm gonna make sure there's a bunch of ways to solve this or solve this or kill that or overcome this or whatever. And there um, might be horrific consequences. <laughs> there might. Choices. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Please, sorry. I cut you out there. No, no, no. I, uh, I, I didn't want to like dominate. I, um, I, uh, I'm a lecturer, so I'm sorry. <laughs> you really gotta shut me off. Um, the, um, yeah, no, like having it where like, um, so like I, I think like one of the chapters. I'll use an example, like, you know, like uh, like let's say the the Eye of Jakara. Um, that chapter is the urban starter quest, which of course starts out like kind of on mini rails intentionally. Mm -hmm. You're coming into the port. That's that. <laughs> and you're already together and here's why. Um, but then I'm going to let you go here in a minute. Just hang with me for a few minutes. That was sort of my thinking. And I've, 
I've found great success in my games with that. It actually yeah. to help the players like understand and, and begin to interact and understand the world they're entering. But then it immediately lets them go once they get enough to go. And and then they they feel the freedom and they have a purpose and they can choose whether they want to follow it or not. And I feel like like an adventure, if you read the adventure, go through it. Like obviously there's some scripted things. It's very quick, you know, the quick three act thing. But at the end, it's very wide open. And I kind of like walk through all the possibilities where the story could go, it, depending on what the players want to do to help the referee do that. And, um, you know, everything else is more site based that's the only adventure with like an act kind of structure in the, in the book. But, um, you know, like not saying there's a wrong way to do it. Just saying like, well, if they do this, this happens. If they do this, yeah. this happens. And always, I guess, keeping that kind of in the, in the forefront of your mind, never prescribing one way to solve something. And, um, you know, well, what happens if they just ignore Zarkand and they go sell the amulet because it's worth a lot of money? They say, screw this. What happens? They get rich. Yep. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Wait a minute. That worked? <laughs> They'll talk about that for years. <laughs> <laughs> but then they find out the merchant they sold to, maybe, or the guy he sold to. Suddenly something bad happened to him. And then they're like, uh oh. You know? And then yep. the world starts to feel alive, right? Like it feels like they have actions of, of meaning and consequences. I, I think that's fun. So Yeah, especially once players realize there's actual consequences to their actions. Yeah. There's always that great moment where they realize, oh, crap. <laughs> and then you watch them try to dig themselves out of that hole. Did you ever have a uh, moment like that in your, um, in your own gaming, like where you're a player, where you... You did something and like you're like okay, I did it and then something bad happened or or something really cool happened you know like um like anything off the top of your head let me see yeah well there's there's a bunch um so one of one of them is um in in the campaign guide I have they go to this house uh it's it's a farmhouse is what I call it um and. There's all sorts of crazy magical stuff going on. They were sent there just to pick up an item and bring it back to town. Um, and of course they, they don't know what the item is. Uh, and they get the item out and it, by the, by the time they get the item out, it's very clear. So the, the world itself is fairly low magic, but yeah. everything in this house is magic and um, they get it out. Uh, and then as soon as they go through the front door, the trees come alive and form a large ring on this hill. And then uh, the house itself gets up on legs and like the chimneys become arms uh, and it tells them to give back what they stole. And they're just like, oh, crap. <laughs> That's good stuff. Can they like... Can they like bite it or get the hell out of there? Uh, yeah, well, they can they can beat the house. They can try to get around the trees. The trees uh, don't actually um, they if you don't go near them, they won't attack you. Uh, but if you do try to go near them, they'll try to kick you back towards the house. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Those uh -huh. are always my favorite bad guys, like the whip out on par low level parties. The ones that yep. hit you and you fly and fall prone. <laughs> It's like Sauron at the beginning of Lord of the Rings. Wham, wham. <laughs> it's good stuff, man. <laughs> so, and then they realize things aren't going to be good. <laughs> I had this, um, I was running a game once, and this is the greatest story I've ever seen. <laughs> it's my favorite story to tell. My brother, of course, the legend himself. I have never had a better player than my brother. He's fantastic. He does this really great Sean Connery voice whenever he plays dwarves. So he's playing, he plays <laughs> this dwarf cleric, and he calls him Ballin uh, Ironfoot. And um, my my players were playing uh, Rapanathuk is what I call it. Rapanathuk, Dungeon of Graves. And um, what happened was they got really deep in the dungeon, and they found, um, and it's the only party that I've ever ran that actually found uh, Lord Navari's uh, lair. For those of you who know Lord Navari's level 9A, ooh, ooh, in the river. <laughs> and so there's this death symbol, and it's, oh, it's so good. It's really not supposed to be found, but, you know, it's, it, but they found it randomly. And I, I can't make this up. Like, 
party just happened to be on the shore within 60 feet or whatever. Someone tosses up a detect magic, just purely like they're trying to find a place to camp. Like one of them gets the bright idea, like I'm going to like move like mold earth on the ceiling and we can like fly up there and then like look like this, like a little cubby, like mm -hmm. 100 feet up. So nothing can walk by and eat us. And um, while they're trying to figure that out, someone just like, hey, Rob, I'm going to walk around and just check the area, make sure nothing's sneaking up on, you know, that kind of thing. And he just finds the death symbol just within range under the water in the river. And so they they all stop what they're doing. They're like, what? Wait, what? Powerful what? <laughs> they all like, you know, what treasure? And so they go through this, like, you know, they get through all the traps. They go through this underground tunnel, which, again, I've never had anyone find this. And it's like, of course, super high level. And this was Pathfinder. And um, so this guy, there's this death knight, you know, no spoilers. There's this like death knight, CR-23, who's in this crypt. And he's got all these treasure chests, like three treasure chests in his crypt and you kind of see them when you walk in like they're glittering in your light you know and then he stumbles out boom boom with his big armor death like demon armor and all this stuff and like you know quickly the players are like you know this guy isn't afraid of us we're pretty strong and there's like six of us so someone runs up and he power word kills them and everyone goes ah! you know? <laughs> <laughs> what happens is all my some of my players smoke cigarettes and so they were like hey rob can we take a five and i was like Okay, yeah, this is gonna be a long one, or maybe not, you know, kind of making jokes. <laughs> so they go outside and they huddled. Okay, it's a little cheating there. Whatever, I don't care. I love doing what they want. I'm like, it's CR 23. They're like ninth level. I'm gonna slaughter them. They come back and they had a barbarian and a monk in the party. The druid's the one who got power and kills. <laughs> Sorry, Druid. So, so the two, the, the two had high speeds, land speeds, and I love this player choice. <laughs> this, this is great. So the, they turn around, they go, "Hey," they go, "Rob," uh, you know, it gets to the monk's turn. My friend Roland, and he's like, "All right, Rob, I'm gonna go around him." And he goes all the way around him, and he goes like, you know, like ninety feet, like a, a move. You know, it's like, and so he double moves or whatever. So he zoom, and he runs into the crypt. And yeah, I'm not thinking anything. I'm just gloating. Like I just killed one of them. I'm going to kill the rest of them and chase them all off. I run up and I'm like, I'm going to kill one around. It's going to be nice and, and wonderful. The other guy, the barbarian, who's pretty fast, not as fast, runs the other way around me. And I'm like, what a bunch of idiots. Like now I'm just going to slaughter their wizards and their cleric. This is going to be even better. And my guy's going 20 feet per move. Boom, boom. And he, he like unloads on you when he gets to you. You know, you're just dead. Mm -hmm. So I get up and I'm starting to like tango with the fighter, this, whoever it was. Yeah, it was Rebecca. She was playing the fighter. The, the world's ugliest female fighter with six charisma. So it's <laughs> like, it's great. And so like she's slugging it out. Someone's healing her to keep her up longer. She can barely survive. All of a sudden, the monk and the barbarian come running out of the crypt with a chest each. And one of them goes, that's right, Rob. We're mugging you. <laughs> so they run out go in the tunnel and i was like wait a minute and I, I couldn't catch him i was too slow and what happened was i'm, I'm trying to catch up with this guy I'm like i could just get within range i can kill him you know throw a fireball or and like they turn around and they want the my brother seals up the underwater tunnel and uh I, I, you know, i'm gonna hack through it for like eight hours and maybe get out at some point and so they run off <laughs> They get out of the dungeon, find a way out, and they got the, the loot of this CR-23 creature. And, you know, Pathfinder, that matters, right? Nice. <laughs> so this is the best part. <laughs> they go all the way back to their keep. They lay the stuff out. It's like the you know, it's like mid-afternoon. They're just, like, slapping each other's hands, mocking me in real life. <laughs> and, like, what they don't know is that des in, one, in one of these chests, is this small little crystal box, which is a box of holding, if you go read Panathuk. And it's got a lit a demi lich in it. And like they don't oh. know. <laughs> so they start opening one chest at a time, and I start recounting what they find, just cracking up on the inside. And <laughs> they get to the last chest, and they open it up. They, they're like, oh, this crystal box is worth like 10,000 gold. One of them appraises it. And they're like, oh, I bet there's some big diamonds in here. And all the other guys are looking through the magic item compendium, the DMG. What am I going to buy? <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, my brother opens the box. And I describe this little golden or the emerald uh, 
skull rising up, which of course immediately they all know what that is, and they all just stop, you know, and they look up. And it's like the CR 32, like in the <laughs> and they're like ninth level. He's he would slaughter them, right? So I, I of course do what I'm gonna do, like you know, rolling on the table. I'm like, all right, time stop, buff, 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 pr prismatic sphere, you're all caught. Can't escape, and then, and then it just goes in and out of the prismatic sphere, forward wilting. And what happens? <laughs> this is the best part: they survive. I, I I go in. They realize they're done. It's over. Like there's no way they're gonna get out of this. They can't even hit this guy. He's got like an AC of fifty something, like an old Pathfinder rules, you know. And the 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 demi lich like goes in, hoard wilting. Everyone drops or dies outright, except my brother. My brother, Balin Ironfoot, the, the dwarf who lived. He's got like almost no hit points left. He's just hanging on by thread because of his big constitution score. And um, he's got the box in hand. He's a moron who let the thing out right? <laughs> without like peeking, I guess. Mm -hmm. So he turns around and like it, it, it could go in, use its ability and go out. And it, so he just, what's he going to do? He can't even see it through the sphere. So all of a sudden he just goes, Rob, they're ready in action. And I go, okay, well, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> About to kill you. <laughs> so Debbie Lynch comes in and he goes, Rob, my ready to action goes off. I'm like, all right, what do you want to do? And he goes, I'm going to take the box of holding and snap it back on it. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's touch attack. And I look at the thing with the buff and the buff is like an AC, like, 20 something with 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 all the buffs on it but that was its lowest ac score everything else was like 50 something and so my brother's like he does the numbers real quick and everyone's doing it with him you know because they're all like Steve, he's gotta live and he's gotta roll 17 or better to like Ooh. you know like so this is a this is pretty much like oh my god like it's almost over right mm -hmm. he takes the die he rolls it he used to my brother used to have his power glove and it was like his michael jackson glove with you know, his uh -huh. And he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, my, he goes big MJ's here. <laughs> like all my friends, they take out like the Fargo hat and they're like, the helm of greater greatness stands with you. And he takes the tie and he's like shaking it for like five minutes and everyone's like praying and watching, you know. And like he rolls the die 17 on the head. Like, oh, you know, you know, like he's, I'm like, you snap it in there. And one of the items in the other chest is a portable hole. So he takes the thing, the bag of holding the box holding, throws it, and what happens? Like in first said, they killed the demi lich at night. <laughs> and they kept the three hundred something thousand gold or whatever. Wow. And they, of course, he's like, I got plenty to raise you all back. It won't even put a dent in this. <laughs> yeah, and they just they still mock me to this day. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. That was so much fun. One of the reasons why I love Dungeons and Graves, because all the stuff I'd seen before that, you know, like it didn't have that. You couldn't do that. You know, like yeah. I only can tell that story and many others like it. There's so many others because of the design principles. And I to kind of take it back to the beginning. Like uh, that's what I was trying to do when I wrote this. And I'm still writing the last um, volume is how can I make it like that, where it might create those those experiences with people who are playing it because they're so, you know, they're. <laughs> never forget them, you know, like, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. definitely. So. Yeah. That's the most important thing is, you know, you could have people who you play with 20 years before and the great games, there's always that moment that everybody remembers. Yeah. I, I there's so many just from those, those campaigns. Um, the, the upper temple of Orcus fight is just, I, every time I played that, that's worth telling a story over every single group that gets there, no matter what happened to them, whether they all died or not. Uh, it's just so much fun. I uh, I just I love those types of games, and um, you know I, I hope my book um, does the same. You know, like groups that play it, can't, well, they'll tell me awesome stories one day that I'll just be like, "What? You know, I've never seen that before." Oh uh, yeah, that'd be great. You should have a comment section on your website <laughs> where people tell the stories. Which, by the way, for anyone who's looking, um, the both the Kickstarter and uh your website are both in the description down below thanks uh all right so um what uh what are people gonna get if they buy this awesomeness <laughs> <laughs> a mug a cr 23 death 
<laughs> you get your one chance of fame. No. Uh, you get, um, I mean, well, like the, the, I guess the standard one that most people seem to be gravitating towards is the offset run. Cause I didn't have one the first time, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was my first book. So I, I did the print on demand thing, you know, like, because I, you know, that's the good way to, it's a smart way to do it when you don't have the, the ability to, to, to pay for the offset. But now that, right. you know, Kickstarter and everything makes it so, you know, it's it, once you get your kind of, you know, you kind of get out there and get a little experience in your belt, and get your second level, you can go mm-hmm. up there and attempt it. So I, I looked into it and I had so many people telling me I want an offset run. I want an offset run. And my original plan was just to do print on demand for the first three and then come back and do an offset later. But it's so, I mean, I had like 200 people reach out to me over like a two month period, like telling me how much they want an offset um, or they're going to wait till they get an offset, you know? And like, so mm-hmm. then I was just like, okay, I think I need to do an offset. <laughs> That's what the stars are telling me. <laughs> so go ahead. What were you going to say? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it definitely seems like people have responded very positively to it. Yeah, no, I, I'm blown away. I, I I didn't think it would do this well. I thought it would do well. I just, you know, I, I thought it would fund. I just didn't know it would do this well. So I'm, I'm really humble, really honored, really excited. Like I, and now I feel like this huge burden. I got to keep going, make it just as good. <laughs> but you know, like it's like I said, I enjoy it. It's fun. So I'm, I'm I want to do it, and I think I will. I think it's going to be good. So, um, but yeah, you get you get two offset. The the main one is the ninety nine dollar one, and. Um, you know, you get two, you get two offset books, volume one and two, because volume one's already done and volume mm-hmm. two will be done shortly. Right. In just a few months. So like, um, basically like you'll get both books in offset format, um, which everyone really likes. Uh, I can only do like case bound and, um, you know, like, uh, the, the matte paper and, mm-hmm. and, um, I can, I'm not able to do Smithstone yet. Um, I'm talking to my, my, um, my printing companies are R. R. Donnelly and they have a bunch of small ones. They've gobbled up kind of like the, uh, the storage, the storage places. That's really owned by one billionaire, but they all have different names, but it's like really the same guy. <laughs> it's, that's R. R. Donnelly. So, <laughs> so they have like the guy I'm working with, like he, um, he, uh, he said that, you know, it's, it's going to cost a lot more per unit with, um, with, with the Smith zone. So I have to get to a certain count to make that start to become economically feasible. Yeah. He tried to convince me that it was 5,000, but I'm not trying to get rich off this or anything like that. So I, 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 so I, I'm, I'm looking at doing it anyway. Um, and just, you know, just pissing away. <laughs> just to, well, you know, I, but I have to check the, um, I have to I just have to see what the final total is and then do the final math. And then I can see, can I do it? And I really like a ribbon too. It'd be nice, you know, a little ribbon. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, all that stuff costs money, right? So unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> so I gotta see, but it's still I'll say this. The 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 model ones that I've seen already that that are the ones as it is now, uh were just, I mean, really nice books. I mean, think of a really nice college textbook you, you just drop two hundred dollars on, you know, that's never gonna break. <laughs> Have anything wrong like that's what these were like because that's what they usually do is they do those kinds of books but they do other stuff too they do a bunch of all, all kinds of stuff at this company oh. um, but um i i turned around and um i wanted american made company that mm-hmm. was important to me um so it, and it's hard to find them because they've all gone to eastern europe and china um, yeah you know so <laughs> for those who don't know <laughs> like it's, you and it's, it's significant rough. like it's cheap if i go over to china i'll 30 to 50 percent cheaper you know yeah i can give you your smith so now <laughs> yeah but the problem is you never know um i knew yep. a lot of people who were printing comic books right before covid started uh yeah. and then everything got screwed up and then there was a, a period of time where um something was going on at the port of long beach in california which is where most of those ships from china will come and there were there were literally like 40 50 ships docked or uh, anchored out on the coast uh, because they they couldn't get in there and people were like well you know i don't know i can't tell you when you're going to get your book (laughs) and some of them waited like nine months to get the books that they ordered yeah and i i want to be able to drive there and see them printing it and i can't it's two hours away it's just took over to dc so i can you know it's south of dc like in maryland but i can go over there and and just um and watch them and take pictures and send it to the backers there it is yeah. <laughs> you know like and then i go pick them up if i really want to 
<laughs> probably won't do that. But, <laughs> but, well, but you never yeah. know. <laughs> you never know. Maybe I'll just will. Know. I'll just throw them all in the back of the truck. And, <laughs> woo! The Forbidden uh, North Mobile. Uh, so clearly the campaign is funded. Um, yes. When when do you think it's going to fulfill? I tell everyone worst case scenario, uh, the, the PDFs, the digital stuff, because everyone gets a digital with any physical book. So you get, mm -hmm. you get all that stuff, the maps, the art, no matter what. Um, uh, so you'll get the digital stuff probably by Christmas Day, um, and then you'll get the oh, physical nice. stuff a month or two after that, like, uh, you know, depending on the shipping, but uh, I'm really trying to have it done. Um, I don't want to make promises. <laughs> I'm really trying to have it done, done uh, by the um, end of summer, um, maybe to get it out a few months earlier, but um, push that up three or four months. But I'm, I can't, I can't be sure yet. Just a couple things. I got to see what happens. But um, last time I was actually ahead of schedule. Um, <laughs> I didn't really tell my backers this because I was panicked. <laughs> but I, I was actually ahead of schedule. And then the OGL crisis happened. Oh, and yeah. Everybody just stopped working because everyone, yeah. you know, even I, you know, was like, I might have to like redo what this whole book's for, right? Not to rehash that whole thing, but, but basically like two months straight of just no productivity because like, me and everyone else was trying to suddenly change their business model because they didn't know what was going to happen. And then, of course, after all that work, what happened? Right? They're like, "Creative Commons, bro!" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone's like, "What?" <laughs> so now everyone's like, Ugh. "So some people were already committed to whatever they changed. Some people like me had not. Um, so then I was able to just kind of, okay, I just lost two months. So I was supposed to be done like early, like two, three months, and." Boy, that that really <laughs> that brought me right up to the deadline. So I was glad I built in that extra time. Uh, but um, that's what I did this time. I built in extra time to to hopefully um, as a padding, just in case, you know. Nice. Uh, let me see. I think we had some questions a little bit earlier. Uh, so. Do you think uh, creators will go for more of an online type game with all the new technology? Example, groups playing on PC. Oop, put that back there. More creators will go for more of an online type game. Example groups. Like like it versus like playing tabletop or like or games that are um, like VTT stuff. Is that? Uh, I'm not sure. I I have a theory that a lot of what Wizards is doing um, is going to be, they, they want to basically take D and D beyond and make everything online so they can monetize everything. Um, the video games. I, yeah, closer to video games. Yeah. And then if you think about it, AI isn't quite there, but I think they're going to try to replace the DM with AI. Uh, you know, Maybe it gets good enough. <laughs> I, don't um, I don't know. You know, well, to, to me, it's still going to be different. It's still going to be a video game because even though AI are like pretty good, it still has to have some sort of parameters where, you know, just like with the Demi Lich story, when you're playing on a tabletop with real people, like you never know what could pop up. <laughs> no, hundred percent. I, I agree with you. I think, um, I just, I think in the, the name of, uh, you know, like it's a business. They're going to, what can they do in the cheapest and maximize their money? And they're analyzing, like, you know, I taught rhetoric. So the art of persuasion, right? Like, so like, uh, you know, Aristotle did a lot of that stuff. Right. And then mm -hmm. that, that marketers took that and <laughs> made it into making money like that. Right. So like they, um, you know, they turn around and they, uh, um, you know, that's what they're doing. So how, what, one of the things you're doing is who's my audience. Yeah, you know, like that's the first thing, right? Like, what's my audience? What am I trying to do? And so, like, I think Wizards of the Coast is saying, well, what's this generation like? What sort of stuff? Or what's their experience? Yeah. And so, I think they're trying to take, you know, our old musty books that they probably don't have, and turn them into something that matches them, so they can make more money and maximize. Like, you know, which I mean, that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not going to criticize them for that. I mean, their business, like, but at the same time, like. You know, yeah, I do agree. It's going to lose some magic, right? You're going to lose some of yeah. that, especially the AI thing. I, I didn't even consider that. 
it's actually pretty smart. I think that's probably something they would consider, or at least to do a lot of the heavy lifting for them. You know, they drop all their like their books and the adventure paths in there. Think about all the content Wizards owns, and they drop it in the AI, and the AI starts working that out. Like I'm sure they already have, you know, and mm-hmm. before long the prompts and the, you know what I mean? Like yeah, well, I mean if you, if you look structure, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and if you look at um, they they had a. CEO or president change. I'm not sure what her title is, but they brought in uh, a lady who was in charge of Microsoft's Xbox division. Um, oh, so right. that makes me think And <laughs> and I, I can't remember who it was, but they've said that um, the game is under monetized because, you know, being a DM, usually it's the DM who buys the books. Yep. You know, and the other players, they, they just sort of play for freed. Free uh, except for, yeah, except for their crippling dice habits. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think about uh, playing on a virtual tabletop like Roll20 or Foundry versus playing in person? Well, I mean, like I prefer table um, to mm-hmm. like being in person. I think there's certainly something. But I also really actually, now that I've been forced, all my friends are back in Florida, so I don't really see them enough to play no. a consistent game with them. So I have to do online myself. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of value in VTTs. I think that they're really cool. Uh, and like, I like roll 20 people kind of sass it, say foundry is better. I've never played foundry, um, as the referee, I played a few times as a player and it does seem cool. Um, but I, I really like the VTT stuff. And I think, um, like I would actually want to play ideally, like where everyone had their laptop open at the same table. So we're all still there and we also mm. roll dice, but I can keep everything on the, the, the laptop and like you know because i mean it's kind of cool the vision and stuff that's kind of mm-hmm. neat so i to me like i would love a hybrid personally that's how that would be my ideal experience now it's just nice to have the tokens and the maps and the, the vision stuff but then we can see each other now you don't have the discord smash where six people all leap up at once and say something and nothing gets yeah. said for three minutes yeah that's a good point uh, you know i i kind of forgot but um I was playing in a group with uh, with a bunch of guys a few years ago, and uh, the DM needed a break for a while. So one of the other guys took over, and he was running, um, I think it was Tomb of Annihilation on... Uh, he had it for Roll20, uh, but we went to his house, and he just had like the map up on a screen. So when we're doing the hex crawl, he would, you know, piece by piece, show us the map and stuff. And that, were, that worked out pretty well. I totally forgot about that. That's a good point. Yeah, some hybrid uh, works well, especially now that I'm getting old, uh, and you know I need the readers. Like the the light from the screen really helps. <laughs> All right, hundred percent. Like, and it's like ooh, flashing colors. I can stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the um, and I mean, I don't know. I've heard some people mocking them because of the the graphics or something with D and D. I don't know whatever they're doing. I've never played on that, so I don't really know much about it, but. Um, if they could get it to a place where it was like a video game, I mean, that'd be kind of cool. If, if we did it the way I was saying, like, I would still want to, yeah. but, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think that there's something like, you know, playing a video game and, and yeah. playing D and D is just different because whatever's in my mind is way cooler than whatever Skyrim does or sure. world of Warcraft or whatever sure. you want to say. Uh, so I don't know. I think, I mean, I think it would be a neat experience, but sure. uh, uh, I don't know. To me, it's it's always the best is to um, get with people in real life. Uh, now, I can kind of understand companies why they want to go more digital. I think yeah. some of them took the wrong lessons from COVID uh, <laughs> in, in that they're like, oh, look, all these people want to play online now. And it's like, well, how many of them really wanted to play online versus they would get arrested? <laughs> you know, and stores weren't open. So I think that, you know, how much of that is real and how much is that was necessity? I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, certainly, I mean, like companies are going to right? they're going to take advantage of whatever they can do. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of companies, you know, like I'm going to shoot my sleazy government contracting job. Now it's almost totally a remote, um, you know, and, 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 but I mean, there's, it's like to kind of make a funny analogy, Dini, there's something lost there than, than when you're not in the office, like the one or yeah, two times yeah, yeah. and I'm in the office, 
you know, it's like suddenly like, you know, like you're, you're making faces, you're talking, it's just totally different. Right. And it's, it's better, you know, it's, it mm -hmm. is better, you know, like, yeah, it saves money to do it the other way, but it's better. Right. And I, you know, like I like VTT stuff because it does bring more people together, makes it easier to find a game. And that's always been a problem, right? Like since we were you know, young, it's so hard to find. Yeah, people yeah, to play. yeah. But it feels like, um, you know, I, I think it'd be cool to see like what can they do with the technology to sort of enhance the play experience. I don't want it to take over like what, you know, what you were saying they might do. Mm -hmm. It's very possible. We'll try it. Um, but I, I do like the idea of enhancements if you want them. You know, I think it's kind of neat. Like when I'm with Roll Twenty and I do the explosion, like yeah, yeah, I, yeah, roll fireball. It does add a little something, you know. Do do do. <laughs> sure, and and I think they're uh, the maps are great too. Yeah. In that you know you could have it dark and then they can really only you know you put the uh, borders on there so they can literally only see what the what they would be able to see. You know, which if you've got a map in front of you. you sort of have to like put post-it notes or paper or something to cover up parts of it. Then they have an idea of how large the thing is anyways. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, like, there's advantages and disadvantages, but I, I do miss, a t I want a table game so bad. I've, I've actually never been to a convention ever. Um, and oh. I know, yeah, I know that's terrible. Right. Um, but I'm really thinking about going to that North Texas one uh, in Dallas or whatever they call it like this summer. Mm -hmm. Um, just as a, not as like a vendor or anything, just going there as a dude and like finding a group and just rolling up with my dwarf, a seventh level dwarf fighter Nice. <laughs> and just playing, you know, and like, um, I'm, uh, I'm kind of, uh, I'm excited. Cause like, that's, that would be the first in-person game I've played in a long time. So that'd be fun. Uh, I know there's a uh, Claricon coming up, uh, around Toronto. It's a little closer Claricon. to you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's put on. Uh, there's a guy on YouTube uh, called the Dungeon Minister. Yeah, I saw your video with him, part of it, about the first half, and then a boss like try to put a meeting together. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I'll work. I could finish it, <laughs> Victor. You did, Victor. Okay, all right. <laughs> He's got a Kickstarter right now. He's doing the uh, old school uh, stuff, modern. Yeah, yeah, for uh, modern necessities. He was on uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, I didn't know he was on here. Big. <laughs> was you holding out on me, buddy? Yeah, that was a great show, too. Oh, I'm going to go back and watch it. I um, I didn't know he was on here. I um, He did, I don't know, maybe he said it, but he did uh, uh, one of the chapters in um, uh, the verse volume, and then he uh, did a lot of the encounters that are in the underworld, like some of the random encounters and a couple of set encounters that um, maybe about 20, 25 of them. Um, so and that uh, Vic, I might be calling you up to do more here pretty soon <laughs> for the castle anyway. Very cool. But um, yeah, no, it's uh, uh congrats to you, buddy Vic. Uh, great job, man. You're lo unlocking all your stretch goals. He's got this really. You already know, but he's got all these like uh, stretch goals coming out for like westerns and all the different kinds of uh, gun type games you can play with OSC, which is it's really neat. Yeah, it's it definitely looks uh, like a very cool addition. Uh, I, until he had started this one, I hadn't seen, uh, somehow I missed the fifth edition one that he did, uh, before, but it's, uh, it looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, it's cool. He's got a suitcase nuke. <laughs> <laughs> What's better than a Demi Lich in a crystal box? A suitcase nuke. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Uh, well, I know you're a busy guy. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Is there anything uh, anything else people should know about Gods of the Forbidden North, Volume 2? Uh, specifically Volume 2. Uh, it's, or 1. Or... Yeah, no, I guess, um, uh, I guess some of the things, I, I don't know, it's probably somewhere on there, but I only, uh, other than the Wandering Monster tables, I only use um, pretty much new monsters. Um a lot of times they're like a variation of something just to make it new. Um, but one of the things I like kind of going back to what we talked about, like being consequences, making things scary. Mm -hmm. One of the other ways I like is when it's, they don't know what the monster is they're facing or seems similar to something, but they're like, wait a minute, it's different. And I always find that my older players who know the monster manual from every edition from back, they get scared and suddenly they're not so tough and ballsy. <laughs> Yeah, and then they get scared yep. of death, you know, because they don't know what they're facing. So, 
I have wanted to do that for this. So, I mean, some monsters are totally spanking new. Some are like little odes, little uh -huh. homages to, um, you know, this or that creature, like the trow and stuff from Myth of Fallen Lords. <laughs> you know, nice. Stuff like that, you know? Little, yeah, little I, I like out. doing that, that too. Uh, in, in the campaign I'm working on, um, <laughs> you don't meet any goblins until you're level nine. And then they meet them and they think, oh, little goblins. But I scaled them up. <laughs> so they're a challenge. <laughs> Heart strength. Ugh, two death says what? Yeah. And then uh, they've got like special ankle biting abilities. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> you always got to keep your players on their toes. Hey, yep. <laughs> you gotta scare. I like to. I like to give him classic monster. Classic monster. Something new. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, um, like I had mentioned before, pinned in the chat. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, there is the link to Gods of the Forbidden North for the Kickstarter. Also down below, and uh, also got the link to your. Um, to your own website for the various things that you've published over at uh, pulphummock.com. Thank you so much. So thanks a lot for coming. Um, and for everyone else, uh, someone will be on next week. Not quite settled yet. Uh, but if anyone is interested, Friday night I will be on the Dungeon Delvers channel playing Classic Gamma World where I play a human in a mech suit. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> good night, everyone. And we'll see you all soon. Oh, and if you could like, and subscribe to the channel. Definitely helps us out a lot. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Have a good night.